Welcome back, everybody. I'm Lance Armstrong, and this is the Forward Podcast. This is going to be episode four. Um, how you guys doing? Have a good week? Uh, first of all, thanks for we're getting some emails from folks that uh, they're digging the podcast. We got an email from some of the kids that swam in the Olympic trials. I've talked a little bit about swimming and watching the trials. So thanks to those uh, guys and gals for sending in uh, some love and uh, congratulations. Um, anybody do any traveling? Fourth of July, we, you know, Fourth of July is a big deal around, uh, Aspen here where, we, where we're chilling or hanging out in the summer, you know, growing up in, uh, Plano, I never, it's not like, uh, well, they may have a Fourth of July parade in Plano, but mom and I never went down to it. But, uh, the, the parade here in Aspen is like a big deal. Um, it's like takes over the whole town and it seems like everybody in town is in the parade. And uh, and all the people that are from out of town are, are watching the parade. So uh, we've done that for a few years. We take down this restaurant um, that sits up a little high so we can watch all the floats and whatnot. And this year was cool. Our son, Max, um, he's been riding his dirt bike. He's got a little KTM 50 and he rides with the Aspen Dirt Bike Club. My buddy Kiko runs. And so they they actually ride in the parade. Kiko's you know ripping wheelies down the street, and he's got all these kids and other people riding their dirt bikes. So Max was featured in the parade. That was fun to see. And then Olivia got on one of the the floats. Olivia's my five year old daughter. One of the floats um, from uh, Cozy Point, like the equestrian place down there. That was a big old deal for the kids. And then you know that thing starts at eleven, which means that uh, you know the rose started flowing at eleven. And uh, which never is a good thing. That lasted all day. That made sure that July fifth was a terrible day for me. But I, I'm I'm recovered. And um, yeah, the, other, the only other thing we did on the fourth is we, after we have lunch and things continue to get sloppy, we me and uh, the sheriff and um, a few other buddies, Jimmy Johnson, the forty eight car, um, my buddy Todd, a bunch of us, anyways, went down to the local golf course and we play in the Barefoot Invitational. It's a really stupid idea, but we do it every year. You got to, uh, must be, well, must be tipsy, um, must be barefoot, can only have five clubs, and cannot take a practice swing. Otherwise, it counts as a stroke. And there's money involved. A really bad idea. It might be, that might be the last year we do that. But anyhow, it was a great day, and I hope you all had a great fourth and a great holiday and uh, safe travels. You know, the other thing we get a lot of uh, emails and questions about is, is um, where's, the, where's the cycling podcast? Where's the, where's the, the cycling-centric discussion? And um, I've, I've thought a lot about this, and I've, I've uh, talked a lot about it with, with my guys. Um, and so, you know, it, it, we go back and forth, and it's a tricky one where – um, a, a podcast that's called the Forward Podcast is is where does cycling fit in that? You know, is, is cycling cycling's not necessarily a part of my future for all of the obvious reasons. Um, so a, a reverse podcast, I'd sit here and tell you stories and reminisce about the old times, and and you know, you guys could either dig that or not, or hate on that or not, whatever. Um, but I guess uh, you know it's worth where I come down on it now is it's worth, um, even if, if the focus is forward, which it is, it doesn't take away from the fact that I still watch the tour. I still enjoy the tour. I still have opinions about the tour. Those are all forward impressions and forward thoughts. So, um, with that, you know, it's, it's been, it's been interesting kind of watching the tour. It's, it's oftentimes on in the house, we're here on mountain time. So it's, you know, I get up at six thirty or so and, and just kind of put it on in the, in the background while I'm drinking my coffee and reading the news and figuring shit out. There are days where it's a little more exciting. So you pay attention. Um, but it was, you know, there's, there's certain things. I mean, I thought, I thought, I thought, uh, I don't have any strong opinions, I guess, about the performances so far. Um, other than, you know, the, the day, the day that Peter Sagan won, he was, you know, basically a, a man amongst boys. I thought that was impressive. I thought, and I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in our also quasi part-time Aspenite TJ Van Garderen and his, in his, 
uh, role there at Team BMC. I've, I was worried about TJ um, going into it with this idea that there'd be co-leaders. Um, and so I was interested to see how that played out. Unfortunately for Richie Port, who, by the way, is a completely you know off-topic um, side discussion. I, I think Richie Port, I'm just, this is just a prediction. You guys can either remember it or not. But here it is. My prediction is that Richie Port, I think Richie Port will win the Ironman at some point in the future. So just, just put that in your minds. But uh, unfortunately for him, he got that flat. And, and the guy, the neutral support who came and changed his flat tire, I mean, literally my seven year old son could have changed it faster. It cost him two minutes, which, uh, you know, in, in some ways kind of starts to really affect how your tour is going to end up. So unfortunately for him, you know, some bozo gets out of the car that doesn't know how to change, a, you know, a, a, a rim or a wheel. Um, the only, the other interesting thing too, and I, <clears throat> I tweeted about this and I talked about that, I got a bit of a discussion on Twitter with, uh, with, with some folks was, it was a, a couple of days ago I was, I was watching and I was, I, I had left to go work out. So I DVR'd it. And as I was scrolling back, I, I, I see that they're, um, they're interviewing, um, what the hell is his first name? What's Tinkoff's first name? Is it? Well, whatever his friend, it's not Igor. Maybe it is Igor. Oh, Oleg. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's another <laughs> Oleg Tinkoff. And he's, he sponsors the Tinkoff team. Very uh, brash and obnoxious at times. Says some almost really offensive, inappropriate things a lot of times. But at times, too, he, he, he speaks to the status of cycling, the structure of cycling from an ownership standpoint. So here's a guy, you know, again, stop, let's not worry about what you think of him or what you, your opinions on what he's said in the past, but just as an owner who's invested about $20 million a year for years. Um, so he's speaking as an owner, talking about the structure of the sport and talking about the future of the sport, how this sport moves forward. And what does that look like? And, and how can you keep major backers in the sport when the structure is what it is, which is an antiquated structure that, that is a hundred years old, that involves, you know, obviously the UCI, and to some degree, the IOC, um, but involves the more powerful bodies, which are the events like the Tour de France and the Tour of Italy and all of these things. The owners, meanwhile, and, 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 and an owner could be a general manager, that, general manager that just organizes the team. You know, when their funding is up or when the contract was, is up, whether it's with Motorola or the Postal Service or MAPE or any of these other big backers, when that's done, they're done. There's no equity, there's no franchise, there's nothing to sell, there's nothing to flip. So he was talking a lot about this and, and, and how, um, um, you know, how he feels about it and how he feels that, that, that it's time for perhaps an entirely new league, whether that's backed and organized by um, the owners of the Tour de France that puts together a dozen big races and that's it, uh, that excludes and precludes um, the international governing body, the UCI. Um, so I, I tweeted out that I actually agree with him. And you can imagine, right? So the initial, uh, I had to read through the initial 20 or 30 responses from the angry British people that, you know, come back with, you know, what the fuck do you know? And you're a cheater, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we got all that, guys. That's not the discussion I was trying to have. But the, but the point being is that the system is broken and the structure is broken. And, and, and I think it's time for, uh, you know, for, for a, a big boy conversation about how the sport of cycling moves on and evolves and creates its own league. I mean, why wouldn't, and I've talked about this in other podcasts, I love watching these sports. We're just making the team people are balling. Like that's the highlight of their life. I don't think that's the deal with, with you. when you're talking to these guys that are riding in the Tour de France right now, that all they care about is the Tour de France. If you say, what about the Olympics? They go, oh yeah, that. So I don't think that's our sport. And, and I think you got to focus on, I think you have to create an entirely new equity and, and team structure. I think these events have to share in 
the revenue side. So whether that's TV revenue, sponsorship revenue, just like any other big time sport, just like any other big time league, pro cycling should be no different than the NFL and Formula One and tennis, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, it was fun to have the discussion. It was cool. It's, you know, you, you get the you get the hate, right? And then I'm like, what the fuck? So then you go look at, you know, you can you can tag or like, quote unquote, like people's tweets. So I go, well, who's liking my tweet? And you go down and it's and it's all the people you want to like it. It's all the people that have been in the game, that have been in the trenches, that know the system is broken. So that's where I am on that. My guest this week is, is a guy that I've known for a little while. I don't know him very well. He's been in the football business seemingly his entire life. He was, he was born in Ohio and raised in Canada. So he's been in the football business in Canada, Japan. Yes, Japan. Um, and now in Atlanta. He's been the general manager of the Atlanta Falcons for the last 10 years. And uh, he, he's done quite well. He's won some awards over the years, of course, in that league. You're only as good as your last season, maybe season and a half. Um, but he's hanging in there. And by the way, too, he's a good rider. The guy's a strong rider, rips on the downhills on the mountain bike. And a uh, fascinating discussion of, uh, just on the, a little bit of the insights of football, uh, insights of the draft. Talk a little bit about concussion. I mean, the obvious things, but also, too, I was really curious about the draft. Like, what goes in? Like, how, or how deep do you dig on these dudes? So, my guest this week is the Atlanta Falcons GM. Thomas Dimitrov. Here today with Thomas Dimitrov, which, by the way, before today, I mean, I felt a little funny asking a friend, like, dude, by the way, I've known you for a few years. Uh, how do you exactly pronounce your last name? Because I always had an I in the second half. So I was always, in my mind, I was always Thomas Dimitrioff. You thought it was Russian. Well, I also thought you were Canadian. <laughs> not Canadian, not Russian. I, I, well, yeah. I, you know, it, I mean, it, part of these little, these, this endeavor, this podcast endeavor is I actually have to do a little work, a little research, a little uh, reading. Mm. So I learned that. But uh, we'll get into the Canadian thing because I think, I, I always thought, well, I thought those two things. I thought you were a Canadian named Dimitrioff, which is kind of <laughs> fucked up. But anyways, um, so hey, we're this is the, well, I guess this is episode four. This is the second one we've done here in Aspen. So I, you know, I, I know that uh, that you like Colorado. You, I don't know how long you've been coming here, or so I, I have a home in Boulder. Right, I've been coming to Aspen for a number of years. But, why, why Boulder? Uh, when I first uh, was making my move west, and I was trying to find an area to live in and scout the, the West Coast. I wanted to be in Colorado, and I, I ended up getting uh, traveling across the country. I was a big mountain biker, at least self-proclaimed mountain biker, yeah. and I loved you know just the outdoors. And then I became so much more aware of what, what Boulder had to offer from an earthy standpoint, because I do have an earthy organic side to me, yes, and I was vegan for 14 years, which was interesting. And in my profession, you can imagine, you know, just like you'd probably bust my balls if, if I was on your team and I was eating vegan. Yeah, uh, back in the day, that would have been harder to do. But I mean, I think now these these guys are pretty sophisticated between vegan or gluten free or fucking McDonald's, whatever people eat. But um, so, whoa, you, well, then why'd you stop being a vegan? You know what? I, I was traveling around a lot. I was always on the road. And, it became, and when did you stop? I I stopped about uh, ten years ago, um, hmm. and it was interesting because I was just when I was finishing up my my work with the Patriots, and just as I was starting to have some interest in, in executive jobs, general manager jobs, interviews and such. And it was just, it was more, more of a pain in my ass to, to travel around, try to, you know, stop at a Starbucks and not have a muffin because it had dairy in it. And I felt really good eating well and clean, and I still do. And I'm really particular about that. It's a part of my trying to find balance in my life, eating well, having, you know, fitness in my life, because we both know there's a lot of scrutiny out there, you know, when, as you climb a ladder and wherever you are, there's a mental uh, stress there and a strain there that I think I need to be in, in body, mind, and soul needs to be in check to, to survive. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. So then, so, so Boulder, that, that was just your, your spot. That's it was my haven, man. I'd, I'd be there and I would. People love Boulder. Like I, I get it. Anna 
I, I think I talked about this the other day on the other podcast, but um, well, I talked about it, with, I think with Ben because he, we were, we were in Denver and he spent a couple of days in, in Boulder. She went to school there and Anna went to my, my better half went to school there. She just loves it. And I can't, I don't know, man, I struggle with Boulder a little bit. Well, you know, I think uh, I have some really good friends there and I think it's a, the population size is, is a good size close to Denver, obviously. I mean, I love Aspen. I've been coming here more and more now, the direct yeah. flights in the winter time. I know you're not a winter guy here, but I enjoy that a lot. But Boulder, I just, I, I like, there's just an element there that I really like, and it's always outdoorsy. So. Do you ever go to Frosca? I do. Yeah, my buddy. Bobby? Do you yeah. know Bobby? Bobby Stuckey? So he, Bobby was, you know, Bobby was a professional bike racer. That's what I understood. How about that? I mean, I, you don't remember when you sent me a bottle of wine there about three years ago when I went for an a anniversary. You probably don't remember. It was nice of you. That was so nice of me. I don't remember that. <laughs> Somebody came up to me the other day and was telling me, you know, that I did this really nice thing. It was after the five-mile run here in Aspen, the Boogie's Five Mile. And this this lady, oh no, she said we were on a hike here. We were hiking Cathedral Lake, and her daughter was on the hike, and I was, they kind of, we were leapfrogging them or something, and I kept cheering her daughter on, and I, I, I just, and I had no recollection of it, and I'm just looking at this lady going, mm -hmm. well, that's, thank you for sharing that. I mean, what do you say? Right, what do you say? Well, yeah. At least they, they logged one. That's a good thing. Yeah. And so we went biking this morning, and uh, we had a big group. We had, I don't know, seven or eight guys. Thomas took a couple of diggers. I did. I, took I, did. I didn't see any of them, but I, I see the road rash on your, unless that's from another day. No, that was from today. Interestingly enough, three years ago when I first rode with you out here, right, if you recall, I remember showing up to your house the very first time and, and George Hincapie hooked us yep, up, right? George, George was a up. contact. And I remember coming over thinking, okay, I'm, there's going to be 20 people there. I'll probably shake your hand and we'll chat for uh, 10 seconds and I'll be off. It was just you and, and me, right? We went on that ride. I think the first thing you said to me is, can you fucking ride? <laughs> I think that's what you said to me. I'm like, as a general manager, you probably thought I was going to come in there and, and be completely out of shape, which no, I wasn't. George, no, George told me you were fit. Okay. I, I actually asked George. I said, can this guy ride? I'm thinking, you know, a GM in the NFL, you know, most, if I Googled GMs in the NFL, none of these dudes are riding bikes uh, at 8,000 feet. No one's riding. But I, I think I remember vividly. You tell you, fucking you, Jerry Jones ain't riding a bike. No. That's fucking brilliant. This, this happens all the time so my son he downloads that was madden nfl madden and you know so he downloads all these games on my phone and so they this is his seven-year-old my, my son max so he whenever they want you to play or somebody challenges you to match it makes this noise I, like that was the fans going crazy like calling you into the ring and so sorry about that i forgot to mute my phone that's good <laughs> but but so what i was going to say to you is remember we we went on the ride you asked me if i could ride and then we started riding, and I remember you took off. We were, we were conversing all the way out to, it was out in Snowmass. We went out to uh, Snowmass. We rode the Rim Trail. Out rim there. Trail. Yeah. Rim Trail. And then you took off, and you got up there, and you were sitting up there checking your emails. And I remember you were up about, I don't know, how many, how many hundreds of feet looking down on me. And I looked up to see where you were, and I fell. Like, that's the last thing I want to be doing is having you look at yeah. me fall. And I remember we falling. Didn't, we I'm, didn't see it, though. No, I was so pissed off. So I got up there. But my biggest thing was to, I knew I would never obviously be able to even climb, you know, just anything close to being in your whatever sites, of course. But I really wanted to show you that I had some nuts about me to descend. So that was, that's my, that was my biggest goal to leave that you at least could say, okay, he rode hard. So that's all. That's all. That's what I was. You, no, you're, you're, look, climbing is, 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 is one thing. I mean, it's hard to climb up here at, at this elevation and it's hard to, if you don't grow up riding it's that's but downhills you know you see where somebody's got some skills and we did that uh, you filmed some of that for hard knocks right for the the nfl or is it hbo it was hbo hbo yeah. reality show they pick a different mm -hmm. team team every season to to i guess just embed within the team right we had 30 people that were on our campus for a month so when we just for a month for for one full month oh, so it's not for the whole season no just for just for training camp and uh, I remember being out here, and I, I remember asking if you were fine if we did some vids on that because they asked me. I said, you know, you guys are out there riding. It would be perfect because they were trying to set up characters in, in Hard Knocks, right? Right. And we did it, unfortunately, the year that we fired Mike Smith at the end of that season. So there's always this sort of catch-22 we feel in the NFL. When you do Hard Knocks, something could go awry. But I thought it was a good good show. You didn't – I mean, you don't – I mean – I don't know what the word is. I mean, you don't regret it, or you don't. You no, know. no. Because here's the deal: the, is there the, is there a is there a um, is there a trend with teams that do hard knocks? Do they suck? Do they win? Or is it just a toss up? Well, your your team did it. I mean, Jerry Jerry did it, and it's it 
becomes, you know, a situation. My, my team? Cowboys, I was throwing out. Uh, we can talk about that later, but that's, that's a sore subject. Just keep going. Okay, Sorry. well, point being that teams do it, and the, the league now says that if you don't volunteer, then we'll pick people. So our feeling was if we volunteered, maybe it will be 31 years later that we would not be picked again. Yeah. For no other reason. We, the experience was good for us, Lance. We, we did some good things, but we ended up losing that season, and, and that ended up being a treacherous season. And Mike Smith is goes Mike's away. gone, right? And then we hired um, Dan who, Quinn. Who makes that decision? Uh, ultimately, it's the owner. The owner, the owner the Arthur would, Arthur Blank. Arthur Blank, yes. And Arthur and I have a really good uh, relationship. We've worked together. This is my ninth season. Interestingly enough, ninth season. I'm the sixth tenure general manager in this league at 49. When I got in, I was very young. I mean, because yeah, as you know, GMs were younger or older, and now they're getting a lot younger. Mm -hmm. But uh, that. In baseball, too. You see in baseball, it. for yep. sure. Yep. You see it. Honestly, in baseball, I think you, you see the GMs around 30, and you see the presidents at 40. In our league, it's very different. Usually the general manager teams with the head coach to partner, because that's the most important partnership, at least in our minds, in football operations. Then you have a president who is in charge of football op or uh, business operations. Yep. And they're very, very uh, separate. So... Uh, but Arthur, yeah, so Arthur makes the final decision. I mean, obviously, he, we talked a lot about it. and um, so He's into it. I mean, he's into the – Yes. Super into it. He's super into it. Ha has been for a long time. You know, he, he was started a, Home Depot. Co-founder of Home Depot. So he's was just fucking Marcus. loaded. Yeah, I mean, he and he is just so well-versed in a lot of different things. And he – interestingly enough, I know you're a golfer, and, and he's – I see some of his pictures of who he's golfed with, you know, Jack Nicklaus, all these big-time, you know, uh, Lee Trevino and all these guys. It's pretty neat seeing that. So – you know, we, we've gotten a chance to play some really, really cool courses. And yep. As you know, I mean, uh, I say this all the time, and I prob I'm not probably supposed to be public about it, but we've played Augusta National a number of times, and it's been great over the years. And I laugh sometimes, and I joke with them. I'm like, okay, when we stopped winning, we, we, we're not going there anymore. So I, we need to get back on the, in the good graces. <laughs> okay, so in, 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 in you, maybe it doesn't matter, because I guess, and I've read some of your quotes here recently, that, all that really matters is last season or the last game or the last quarter, right? Mm. But if you looked at the t your body of – call it a body of work over 10 years in, in the – or not in the NFL, but with the Falcons. I mean, you add up your win percentages or or does that not even matter? Like if you can say, oh, I'm – you know, what is your record over 10 years? Well, it does matter. I mean, I think – but interestingly enough, um, Mr. Blank and I were talking the other day and we were having just a review of some things. And his point ultimately is, yes, we have to win. It's about victories, Right. You have to have a certain approach to make sure that you're culturally intact, you're working with your head coach, and, and things are operating, moving in the right direction. And we definitely feel we are. My, my new partnership with Dan Quinn, I, I think it's great. I'm really, really excited about working with him. But in the end, it's about victories, right? We, are, we started off 6-1 and one last year, and then we plummeted six games, right? That was tough for our owner. Obviously, it was tough for the fan base. The media jumped on at oh, that I remember point. People were, oh. they were, they were talking yeah. about... Oh, it was – yeah, you go ahead and say it. They were talking about me. They were talking about Kyle Shanahan. No, but it's 6-1. and one. They were talking about yes. how, how great this That's team right. is, and then it goes to 6-2 and two and 6-3, and three, and we, then they start going, what's going on? Yes. And then they were – you know, they had three people that were the fall guys, and it was Matt Ryan, it was Kyle, and it was myself. Right. And, you know, that's that's been a topic of conversation lately. I mean, that's that's come up. I, I made a comment recently that uh, on a talk show up in Boston um, – it was a little bit tongue in cheek because I normally don't talk about my business that way. But um, I had made mention that you know I am on the hot seat, and I believe I teamed that with. I'm also I'm on the hot seat, but so are basically every other general manager in the NFL, unless you won the Super except Bowl. Except Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones, yes, <laughs> exactly. Except for Jerry Jones, and and the person who won the Super Bowl the year before. Otherwise, it's always hot. It's and, always warm. And you guys finished what? What was the record last year? We were eight and eight. We ended up 500. Okay, what happens if you go 8-8 eight and eight again this year? What happens to you? Uh, I don't know what happens to me. I, uh, I like uh, to of think... Of course that, you don't know, yeah. but we'll, I mean... I, I, think, I, I think our owner, Arthur, is in a really good spot now with how I'm teaming with our head coach and how we're building this team. We're really, really focused on um, the type of players that Dan wants for his defense because, you know, he was a defensive coordinator. We feel we have a really, really formidable uh, offense with Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Mohamed Sanu. We just drafted a new tight end. Picked up a free agent along the offensive line, so we feel like we're really we're in a nice spot. Mm -hmm. But we have to win. So to, to your question, you know, a tough question or tough answer, of course. Or I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly where we are. We we have to show continue to show improvement. That's a big thing for Arthur. Right. And and and, and Dan Quinn goes eight and eight again next year or next season. I mean, he, he gets another year. 
Well, Dan, Dan, this is Dan's second year, and Dan has done right. some really good things for yeah. this organization. So, we, I feel very confident that things are going to work out well. Dude, I don't want to jinx things. No, no, no. I look, I'm, I, I'm <laughs> so fine about talking, you know, talking about stuff like this because it's the reality in our league. You know that line, NFL, not for long, right? That's what it stands for. So, the more of this is a really interesting concept. Well, definitely not for long for the players. It's not for long for the players. I mean, this that people are shocked when you hear guys. I mean, when you hear the average career length of an NFL player, I think it's it's less than three years. It might even be less than two years. It's around three years, I think. I mean, that's shocking. It's unbelievable. And the money that everyone thinks that they're making. But, right. well, I will say what used to be a general manager in our league used to get five head coach picks. Think about this. And probably three or four quarterbacks. Now you get – you maybe get two coaches, yep. and if you mess up on a quarterback, because we all know that the teams go as your quarterback goes, you are hanging in peril as, Quarter, a, as a general manager. Quarterback is the most important position? Most important position. By far. By far. Huh. And you oh, – wow. Okay. Well, Lance, it's the most important position, but think about well, yeah, this. I mean, I would, that would be my guess, but what do I know? But that we also consider it, they're a pillar position. So it's quarterback, it's left tackle, it's a receiver, a big-time playmaker, it's a corner – a defensive back, and then it's a D end. So those are five or six pillar positions, and those are the guys that affect. Because in the end, we can talk about depth and everything and building, and there was a lot of talk about Julio Jones' trade, about what we did back then or what I did. And, you know, we gave away – To move up, take that yeah. Cleveland pick, move up to number six. Yeah. And we gave away, you know, two first rounds or whatever, two sec uh, second round and then two fourth rounds, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, it's about the impact players. Right. That's what I believe because that's how you're winning. Of course, depth is good. Do you remember Marv Levy, that name? Uh, the ex-Bills coach? Yeah, the, who just passed away in the last year, I think, didn't he? he did, I don't think he did. I, I think that was, a, that was another coach. Check yeah, it out. But I'll check it out. He made a comment, depth is great until you have to use it. Now, is that the same way in cycling? Depth is great until that guy has to really step up and, and be the guy? Um, I believe in depth. But you also have to make sure you're hitting on your studs. Yeah. Marv Levy didn't pass away. My bad. But he is 90 years old. Check that out. <sighs> yeah, right. Wow. I mean, that was... All those years with Jim Kelly. Yeah, what a fucked up team that must have been. <laughs> I mean, those, they were always there, right? They were like... Yeah, they like, were always Like there. Raymond Pulidor, you know, they just always got second. They were always there, just, right. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Sorry, Marv. I thought... Anyways, hope you're hanging in there, man. He's doing well. So uh, and you guys are getting a new stadium. Is that are. right? You're building... Mm -hmm. I was... Because I was, I was in Atlanta recently uh, meeting with Jesse Itzler. Good dude. Great dude. Just a, a, a freak of nature, really. I mean, one of the most fascinating, cool, wacky, different guys that, that you'll ever come across. But And I think I saw, as we were driving in, by the way, the, the Atlanta traffic, like just... <laughs> dude, how, how do people... Anyways, whatever. So I think I saw the, the, the construction of the new, new stadium. Yeah, I mean, it's rocking. I mean, they're well on the way. It's supposed to open up in 17... So we'll play one more year in the dome, okay, and then uh, it'll open up. It's but it's the way that they're developing it, Lance is, and you know this from Dallas. Like teams, general managers, and coaches always want to close the tops because we want it to be loud. They're creating this to be loud as hell when it's open because it's such great weather there, right? Traffic may not be great, but the weather is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So. In December, late December, as you know, in, in Texas, I mean, it could, you could have a beautiful 72 degree day. But it could also yeah. sleet. It could sleet. Yep. But they did tests where the tests were unbelievable. How how lopsided that was. Very few times on game days has there been inclement weather. Right. So well, you just jinxed that too. So like <laughs> the like like a Seattle stadium where it's loud, super loud, super loud. That's what they're doing. We shouldn't. We probably shouldn't talk about loud, <laughs> loud stadiums. <laughs> oh, we probably should. Right. <laughs> Noise gate. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. You said it, not me. Well, no, I, I, I. It's, it's been a topic of conversation. We, we paid for you it. You talked about it. You mentioned it on the Rich Eisen show. Yeah. I, I, I listened yeah. to it. We had a fit. We lost a fifth. It, in, in, you know, it was. It's very, very public. That was not part of the football operations. Interesting. Here's another thing that I think. Might do you think be other people do that? They must. I think. Yeah, I mean, it's not like you guys woke up and were like, "Dude, let's make let's let's crank up the volume a little bit." Look, I think over years rules have changed and people. All have this shit. The, the deflate lines. gate, All noise gate. You know, even, you know, whatever Belichick with the video, maybe call that video gate or whatever. You know, yeah, I mean, all that stuff. Spy gate. Things have changed. We all know that in rules. Rules have changed. Like, look, I. I, I ha yeah, I, you know, I have no idea what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So <laughs> that's right. You know, 
they change and sometimes we're accepted and sometimes they're not. And I, I think about that at so many levels. And I think where we were very quickly on no, Noisegate was it was a, a business side employee, right? So there, I mentioned earlier that there's a, 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 a president in charge of the business side and then we're in charge of football. Right. Back in the day when a general manager had much, you know, m much fewer, or many fewer people that, that he was over top of, he was in charge of all that. And in today's world, there's such a division of tasks in the NFL because it's such big money. Yeah, such an enterprise. There's no way on, on game day I can sit beside Arthur Blank and be worrying about what's tagging along the, the, uh, the advertisement screens on our, you know, in our stadium. The dot race. Right. Can't, can't, <laughs> yes, that's not, that's not for me. Nor is it me controlling how much V is going into the, into the building. I'm sure that the fans in Atlanta are glad that you don't pay attention or, or are involved in the dot <laughs> right. race. But unfortunately, we lost a fifth rounder because we were held accountable as an organization. I read this fucking crazy thing the other day about Michael Jordan. This is getting off the subject of the stadium, but so the dot race, I was, the dot race reminded me. So he would, he was such a perfectionist and such a pro. He'd get to the arena in Chicago way before anybody else. He'd be like the first guy, like they'd be there just setting up and mm -hmm. the dudes who ran the dot race, you know, they'd know who's going to win. So he got, he befriended these guys. So he always knew who was going to win the dot race. And so he like fleeced Pippen for like fucking, I mean, that article was probably inaccurate, but there was some ridiculous number that, cause he, you know, they'd sit on the bench and, and Jordan would say, you know, a little side action on, uh, the dot on who, which dot's going to win. He, he never lost. Cause he, <laughs> that's funny. I mean, <laughs> what a freak. Uh, all right. So anyways, yeah. So this day who paid for the stadium? That's does, the competitive Mr. side of fucking all stars, right? Yeah. I mean, Jordan, Jordan would, but I mean, I, I feel the same way too, unless it's with my kids. I mean, I let my kids win at everything. Um, but Jordan, Jordan, you know, he competes in everything. I mean, look at his look at golf. I mean, the stories you hear about mm. Jordan on the golf course. I mean, the the amount that he gambles on the golf course. He said somebody says they played with them once, and they said uh, they said um, how much you want. They asked him. He said how much you want to play for. You know what he said? Mm. Whatever makes you nervous. Huh. Good response. So I mean, the guy could say, "Well, fifty dollars a hole makes me nervous." The guy could say, fifty thousand. He doesn't give a shit. Doesn't matter, right? Whatever makes you nervous, but he just wants to compete. It's pretty crazy. Um, well, you kind of had that presence on the golf course the other day, especially in your bare feet. <sighs> yeah, is that a different topic? Thomas is no. Thomas is. We just we just had Fourth of July um, here in in Aspen, and so on the fourth, it's kind of become a tradition that me and uh, our local sheriff and a group of misfits and friends will go down to the golf course after the parade, and this is called the Barefoot Invitational. And of course, at that point, people have had a little too much to drink, and and um, so we we play without shoes. We added a new rule: we can only play with five clubs. Can't take a practice swing. But uh, yeah, that was. Anyways, we don't need to we don't need to bore the listeners with that. So anyway, but I want I want the stadium. So does 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 the city pay for that, or does does, does Arthur pay for it's that? It's a combination combo. It's a combo. I mean, it's right now. It's it's valued or, or at least talked about being at, at one point five. I mean, it's a where you know one point five billion. Right. Where stadiums used to be, you know, two or three hundred thousand. Right. Again, your team and your owner recently, you know, a few years ago, opened up, you know, Texas Stadium. Right. Or is that what it's called now? What's Dallas's stadium? Um, keep coming back to you. Well, I think technically it's AT and T Stadium. Okay. AT and T. But that's an amazing edifice, right? What they did up in New York was a big, a big one, right? Big Met life. Yeah. yeah. But that's two teams using it. I mean, the great thing about Arthur Blank is one of the great things about his approach to everything is he's really, really classy with how he does stuff, right? So he wants to make it iconic. If you look at the architecture, it's really, really interesting to see how it's put together. I mean, it's it's set up like a like an uh, sort of an ocular um, opening, so like a camera opening on the top. It's it's really so it will i'm looking at it online here now that is so it's not gonna oh wow so you can't close can they close it no you can close it for sure you can the mercedes it. is going to be called mercedes-benz stadium right Fuck, did, that's did, fancy did, dude did a big time uh deal with uh with mercedes and uh and all high tech i mean oh, yeah. every wireless inside and you know because phones don't work right when you got how many hundred thousand people there? Right, but they're doing some really cool stuff with that. And you know, I've heard crazy stories. You get you get an IT director that starts a project. I wonder. I've heard stories, and I don't know what they are. How many times they switch during that whole project, right? Yeah, because that's a tough, stressful job keeping up with uh, the Joneses, so to speak. Yeah, 
Exactly. Jerry World. Huh. Is it going to be real grass? Uh, it won't be. Did the player, do y'all care? I mean, I would, I like, I like grass, but I mean, the, these, this turf now is probably pretty. Yeah, the, the well, turf, they've come along with the turf. Nowadays, it's really difficult to do that. Now, they'll put, if we, I think we have the World Cups sometime in the near future. I don't, not near, but I think, it, is it 20? I don't know if it says soccer World Cup. Because they have to play on grass, I believe, in, in soccer. So um, they'll lay down, they'll lay down natural turf, I'm sure. And you're going to have a Super Bowl. You're going to get Yeah, yes, it? we are. 19th. 2019? Yeah, I believe it's 2019. Can you can can the team be? What, what happens like if they can the team be there like in it or no? I'm well. Yeah, you, of course. Do they have the potential to be in it? It was my question yes. to you, but that's kind of screwed if you if you get to play at home for the other team, I guess. We we've said that it would be really nice to play there, and I think Arthur has also made it very clear he'd like to play in the Super Bowl before that. <laughs> so well, Arthur, yeah, he wants to play in the Super Bowl yesterday. Yeah, that's exactly right. So in when in the beginning, well, we can just touch on this briefly because in the beginning, um, or would you, if you just sort of Google you or whatever, you see you see so much Canadian stuff, you know, that the impression. But then if you look farther, you realize I guess you were born in Ohio, yep. so your dad must have just been a coach at, in, in right. the Canadian Football League, and so obviously you you moved with your family up there. Yeah, I mean, I from the day I was born, I was around football. I mean, literally, and and so we, you know. My dad coached different colleges where, you know, I was around football all my life, moved up to Canada because he coached in the CFL. And then I ended up going to school up there because I was up there. That's why people, I was up there probably 15 years. So I think that's where it gets, you know, I have some great friends up there, but I am a huge, huge, you know, patriot. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud to be, you know, American and, and I have, I, I have some great friends up there. My brother still lives up there, but yes, I am American through and through. Yeah. I wasn't waving a flag here the other day at your little party there at the wild fig, but. But I was being and you don't have that. That's you didn't when you because you must some of your formative years you grew up there. You don't have you didn't get that uh, a and a boat and a <laughs> schedule and all no. these things that can hit. So, yeah. That can hit you right. No. We can, can you you can spot a Canadian like immediately as soon as they. That's right. Yeah. Hmm. And then as I as I looked more, the the, the most I mean forget the Canadian uh, adventure, but at some point. At least on Wikipedia, it says you went to Japan to run up some somebody's football team. In yeah, Japan? well, you know, I was kind of in between. I, you know, I started. I literally started at the lowest ranks in football. Again, even though my dad was around, I when was they born say ground school. crew, because if you look it up, it says you worked on at the Cleveland. ground crew. For, yep. What is what? What is what do you mean? Basically, crew? I got we all and I got fired from a, from another job, and I was in between jobs. And I, my dad was scouting for the Cleveland Browns. Okay. Yep. <laughs> My dad was scouting for the Cleveland Browns, and, and I thought, well, instead of me going out in the real world making more money, because honestly, everyone thinks when you're in the NFL, you're making money. And we're, we, as young guys, we're making a pittance, less than a pittance. I mean, it's yeah. horrible because that's just the way it is. So I didn't want to make $22,000, so I thought I'd work on the grounds crew so that when I did come back to football, you know, I was ready to go. So it's funny, though, Lance, because most of the people, I get letters from grounds crew people all over the world. Hey, I heard you became a GM, but you were a grounds crew guy. Really cool. How did you do it? But grounds crew, it's not like mowing the grass. Oh, I was everything. I was pulling tarps, mowing the grass. But my here's the deal. That's my awesome. dad was up in the building. I had contacts. I was really sort of really entrenched in football. During the day, I would pull tarps. At night, I'd go in with Scott Pioli, my, our assistant general manager now, who was my boss at one time with the Patriots, and I would watch video for five or five hours or whatever in the night. So I, I had this dual dual life going on here where I was on the grounds crew, but I was also doing some football. But you just wanted, you know, you wanted your foot in the door. I mean, oh, that was one. Wanted to keep it there. I didn't want to go, you know, working in business somewhere and, and try to come back in. Every time I think of the Cleveland Browns nowadays, I think of Johnny Football, Johnny Menzel. It's crazy. I mean, it, it, I don't know why. I mean, I, I guess partly because he's a Texan, grew up in Texas, and I grew up outside of Austin in, in a little, really cool little city called Kerrville. Um, <clears throat> But that's that's almost hard to believe that that's going on. And, but that's when I when I think of the Browns, I think of I think of Johnny Football. Unfortunately for them, right? That's he's a, he was a I mean a hell of a football player, very very talented. You, you know didn't draft him, huh? You didn't draft him. No, we were ahead of quarterback. Here here's my belief on quarterback. One last thing, and you know this about being the captain of a team, and how important it is. They get You're, hurt a lot. Yeah, and your quarterback better be the toughest toughest tough ass on your team and he is i mean i was around tom brady for a number six years when i was with the patriots as as you know 
gorgeous as he and his his wife are, I mean, he is the toughest guy that I've been around. And to, you know, seeing him and watching how he is mentally and physically, and I think Matt Ryan is very much like that as well. Hmm. And it's fun to watch those quarterbacks who can take a hit and get back up and hide it. I mean, that you know about hiding pain. Yeah, guys who can hide pain. No, but that's different than getting run over by you know a guy who's two hundred ninety pounds and can run a forty and four three and bench press God knows how much. I mean, that's <clears throat> that's. That's next level. Will Johnny football play again? I don't. Wow, that's a, that's a tough one. I've been watching his father's comments and then oh, seeing. That's his, so sad. He, yeah, it's a sad situation. Well, you're. I mean, yeah, as a parent, you, you, those comments, you're like, ah. Mm-hmm. But he's he's small now, isn't he? Like did someone said, he's like buck eighty or something. I don't even know. He, he looks, looks really small. He doesn't. You know. I don't think he's in the gym a lot. No, he's in Mexico now, right? Isn't he hanging out there? I don't know. <laughs> he was in Mexico. I don't. I think he's out of there by now. Okay. Uh, was I, I was going to say something. Not about Johnny football. That's too depressing to talk about. Um, well, we talk, you, you mentioned Tom Brady, and I, I love Brady. I love Belichick. I mean, I grew I grew up in Dallas, so I, I, I mean, I, I have the real. I mean, I was a Cowboys fan my entire life. But when I say Cowboys fan, I mean it was you know growing up with Tom Landry and Staubach and, and Tony Dorsett and you know, all those guys, and then the transition to to Jimmy Johnson and and to Jerry Jones, but then still you had Aikman and, and Emmett Smith, and, and and now it's just a, it's hard to watch. It's hard to be a Cowboys fan when you think about it, for us at least. And anyways, but uh, uh, so point being, like if I'm at home, if I'm watching the NFL, which I watch every weekend, I mean I, I just love watching the Patriots, I, and whether it's you know Mr. Kraft from somehow he's just built a. a a monster there. And Belichick, I just love too the way he he's just so matter of fact about it. Like he doesn't say shit. Like he asks these questions, he's like, that's a dumb question. No, it's incredible. Like how can you it's his approach, you're right. I love that approach. It's a really and I know you would. I mean, you look at a guy like that, he is so smart and so intelligent in so many ways. One of the things people ask me about when when I was with the Patriots, you know, what did you learn, right? They they just want me to like, okay. Check mark or or highlight that that one two or three salient points that you learned and as far as leadership and approaching and building teams, his deal was indisputable role understanding. Yep. Okay, that I, I honestly it's funny because we joke around about it. I I was trying to be semantically responsible and 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 politically correct when I came to New or uh, came from New England to Atlanta, and I was using that. That was basically do your effing job is what it was. Right. It morphed into the same uh, phrase, but we cleaned it up, obviously, and how I delivered it. But that was one of the things. It was, it, was, it was all about lack of entitlement. You would not survive in the Patriots organization without if you had an entitlement bone in your body. Yep. And then, then the third one, at least in my mind, what really stood out was that organization, and you, you can, can attest to this, to be great, to be you know, there and historic organization during the 2000s, Everyone in that organization felt there was a swagger about them. Everyone felt felt that they could kick anyone's ass in their respective job across the country. They didn't wear it on their sleeves. And, you know, Bill was really particular about bulletin board material. But Bill had a really, really good approach with making these people believe, us, all of us, believe that we were the best at our jobs. And that, that carried it a long way, the swagger about it. Because too often coaches are saying, okay, calm down. Don't come across too arrogant or too – and I get that, but – Hey, look, you know about swagger, and 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 there's no way you can be. We were talking earlier, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, yep. Lance Armstrong. You can't be the best in the world many times over without having that. Yeah, no, that you got to be. You have to be a killer. It, you, you know, I I walked. I mean, I walked that walk <clears throat> and lived that life, and and uh, and then you know, then it all sort of changed. And but you know, if you, I mean, the the, the intensity that comes with a Jordan or a Belichick or you know, the, a Roger Clemens, for example. I mean, it's, you know, there's plenty of people that want to sit there and say, ah, oh, he's a terrible, that he's a, Belichick's a terrible person. He's mean. He's too, it's too intense for a lot of people, which I don't, I, I'm not in that camp, right? I'm like, fuck that. Like, mm-hmm. I love that. Um, but it, it, it ended up not working too good for but me. But it was about accountability there, Lance. And, and we can't, we can sit there and talk ad nauseum about millennials, right? Like, how do you deal with the millennials? How, how do you coach them? How do you lead them? And in the end, you can never get away with what we all know, right? It's about team concepts. It's about work ethic. It's about grit that you referred to earlier. That's what it's about. And if you have a head coach 
uh, steering the ship the right way, you have a very good chance to have people buy in. Yeah. Does Atlanta care about them jumping around here? But does Atlanta care about the Falcons? They do. They do. So like it's it's when huge. You know, some cities. I guess I don't want to keep using the Cowboys as an example. I mean, you could almost use the long Texas Longhorns as an example because you know you go to these games, you're expecting to have this this super intense experience, like you're at LSU or Alabama or or Florida State or Texas A&M, and it, it just isn't. It's kind of quiet, mm-hmm. but. It, so you, but these fans, the Falcons fans, are crazy. Like they're super into it, and and the shit gets loud. Just like, just like Texas, you know, University of Georgia is huge, right? So is Georgia Tech, but different, right? In yep. in the city, but when you really drill down on the stats, yes, there's that group that's into college football, but many many more people watch professional football. That's the way it is. So, we have a really interesting fan base, right? We have we have a really supportive fan base, Lance, but we also have a lot of people. You know, as you know, Atlanta is a very transient city, so. That game, when we're playing the Chicago Bears, 15,000 people are wearing jerseys for their home team, but there are Falcon fans in the other games. Right. That's what you probably see differently in Texas or that you see in New England, right? You would see little pockets of visitor team, you know, jerseys. Right. Our no. place, you see a lot more. Right. Huh. And then I'm, I'm always fascinated, too, with the draft. Like, and that's obviously a big part of your job. You have to, I mean, I guess I'm, I've never been, I don't know what it is. A GM does exactly, but I would think that your job is to identify the best talent, and so you're whether you're trading for them or are drafting them. Um, but how? I, I'm just curious, that how much do you learn about these guys? Like, who was your who was the first pick this year? Keanu Neal. He was a safety from the University of Florida. And, I mean, did you know like everything? Had you like did, did somebody on the staff read like every tweet or any every Instagram? Like, like how deep? And dirty does that, and we do. I, and I would think. I mean, if you're going to invest, we have to, right? Tens of millions of dollars, and it's your one. It's not like you get to go. Oh, I fucked that one up. Can I have a do-over? Like right. that's it. Yeah. Once you say the name, bro, you're you're you're. you're so angry. I mean, how just how deep and like I said, dirty does that get? Oh, it's really really deep. I mean, there is there is a lot going on at so many levels. We do psychological testings, probably three or four different psychological tests. We do. We have all the research that we have. Like it just, it was interesting because Dan Quinn was on the staff at University of Florida for a few, a couple years when Keanu Neal was a young guy. So we knew the kid's character a lot. And we have some very good contacts. It's about tapping into contacts. You know that. I mean, it's about relationships in this league. Still, we'll go in. We do a lot of work with the, you know, the uh, academic people. Just we go across the board. We're doing a lot of research. Social media is a big thing. I would think we do a lot, all of our personal interviews. We do psychological testing, as I mentioned earlier. But we also have a different twist to it as well. Um, but how does it – I mean, it's not as if – I mean, the kid doesn't know – I mean, obviously, as it gets closer to the draft, all the L experts, the Mel Kuypers or whatever in the world, tell you – kind of tell you where they're going to go. But if he, if in the beginning there's 15 options for football teams, he doesn't have to do 15 different psychological evaluations, does he? Oh, he, yes. Yes, he does. He does? The, the, those guys are run roughshod. By the end of the process – they are so beaten up over it, right? So there's a lot of talk about maybe adjusting that, how you could do it. But in the end, back to your point, if we're investing that much money, we want our eyes and ears on it and our questions. We don't want to sit there in a group of 25 coaches listening to what you know Bill's asking them. Right. We want to know what we're asking them as the Falcons. But it's, there's a lot going on there. And as you know, you've seen people who are really good football players but have la- you know massive character issues as far as it could be. Here's what here's what my feeling has always been. I mean, you can have a badass guy who's who's edgy as all get out, right? Because I do believe that there's a spot for an edgy guy on your team or two. I've always said, however, you can't edgy. What do you mean, like, I, like I mean arrogant? Living, or, or, no, I mean living up to the edge. I mean, I'm not I'm not talking about legal issues because then you run into situations where you know if someone does something downtown. Edgy also, meaning like drive fast, take chances. Edgy, yeah, or, yeah, like okay. Partying, we, or? F- figuratively, I'd say edgy, like. We always say they could get up to the get up to the end and 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 you know right up to the line where he's not going over where it's not an illegal act on the field or illegal act downtown. They have enough edge to them that that aren't getting sketched out by looking over the edge. Right. Some guys, you can imagine this. They you've seen it in your sport. They come up and they're like really really apprehensive about getting too close because they think they might fall over. The guy who knows he's not going to fall over but he can get to the edge. There's a swagger and a confidence about that kind of player, and I think it's important to have. I also believe you can win with good people, and I believe you can win with people who, who believe in the basic tenets of the team concept. We've talked about that time and again. But if you have the strong enough locker room, you can take care of some of those guys who are off, 
Let me share one thing with you, however. I've, I've talked to a number of players. This is my ninth season now uh, in, in uh, Atlanta. I've had players come up to me and say, when you brought in that a-hole that we really didn't need, he stood out like a th sore thumb because we were such a, a, a cohesive unit, which I thought was really, really interesting. Hmm. So, you know, we, in our league, we go round and round. If the guy is that good, will you take a chance? And that's been the ongoing discussion where I – People want to reach out to owners. You would never take a Greg Hardy. Never. I mean, no. But no. That, oh, we can't well, talk about the. No, guys. but as you know, that that's a big thing, Lance. I mean, DV, domestic violence issues, right now, things have changed in our league, you know, exponentially, right? So, anyone skirting the edge on that side, forget it. And that's you know, there we've had some pretty touchy situations, yeah. you know, with with AP stuff going on, right? There was stuff going on that were really good football players. How do you draw the line? AP. Atlanta. Adrian Peterson. Oh, Adrian. When Peterson. all that was going down, you know, there, there was just some big issues on the table. Oh, there was something about Atlanta police. I was like, oh boy. <laughs> no, I'm just talking about domestic violence situation is really, really, is really an issue, yeah. right? And we all feel very strongly about it. So there's no patience for that. No, there's no patience. No, but yet, uh, you know, yet the the the, yeah, I I don't know. The league, you know, like any any of these big leagues, whether it's the NFL or it's the IOC or any governing body, I mean, they kind of – like if you're Roger Goodell, right, and everybody is talking about concussions. Like same same with politics. I mean, that's called – you know, they, if they're – you know, if a president is getting hammered on infidelity or some other shit, I mean, they like to wag the dog. So, they'll you know, they'll start a war or they'll invade something or, you know, just to divert – and you see that. I mean, you see that a lot in our endurance world, I think. But like, if if Goodell's just getting hammered on concussions, it's like he's like, maybe we need a, a different story. And so he don't want to talk about concussions, right? I mean, he, that's the, the. I mean, so far extreme that, that that at least if you believe what you read, which I don't believe everything I read, but, um, you know, do they let the people run wild with the, with the DV uh, articles? Yeah, I, I mean, they're they're difficult, and any if there's smoke, then there's you know there's always the feeling that you know obviously there's fire and there's there's more to it. But you know, owners, I mean, I know I know you know Arthur and I've talked about it. I mean, look, you you can there are certain you know there are certain levels you can go as far as dealing with someone with issues, right? And then there are, there are other there are other places you just won't go. And you think about it. I mean, we invest a lot of money, and we have 155 million basically salary cap. Okay, 155. 155 for the whole team. Yes. So think about this. So 155 million, and then you have Matt Ryan and Julio Jones. How much of that are they? Yeah, basically they're a quarter of the cap. Oh. So that's where my job comes in, and we have to start being creative with okay, how do we put the rest of the? And team what if you there? pay them over time? What if you just what you say you guys you retire in 10 years, and we'll keep paying you for 30 years? Does that count for the cap? Uh, yes, every everything that's ever agreed upon counts at the cap. That's why you have to be really creative. There are deferrals, of course, but not outside of the contract. Deferrals within the contract. So if you have a six-year contract, equity. Does a player ever get equity? No, very rarely. I don't. I don't think that happens. I don't. That, that would, that's not. That no, would, it doesn't happen. That would be the shit. Yeah. I'd be taking some equity. Yeah. No, you can't. I'm just. I, I guess what I was referring to when it's done. I mean, I'll be interested to see. You know, there's a, a good friend of mine. I like John Elway a lot. And he and I get along. You know, he's in a situation where you know he's got such a. Following. You may be one of the few people. <laughs> well, he's. You know, he and I. I don't know John Elway, yeah. but it just seems like it's always. I don't know. No, I mean, I think. I honestly think you guys would get along well because I think he's a tough guy and I think he's a guy that has a strong opinion and and he's been there. He's a man's man. I mean, he's he can you know, hammer the beers. I hear like he just <laughs> fucking drinks beer like his water. Yeah, I'm not sure. I I don't hang with him that way, but uh, but, but I that, that's I, pretty great. Yeah, but I know he's a, he's a, he's a really he's a good dude. He's yeah, he's a good dude. Uh, so we've talked about the Patriots, and so we, you can't talk about the Patriots and Tom Brady and Belichick without talking about deflate gate and I don't want if you don't want to have a, a position or an opinion on it and, th and by the way the fact that we're still fucking talking about this like I can't believe it's been what's been two or three years that we're still now it's in federal court and I mean, to, to, I mean again I think Goodell he's going I mean this is truly wagging the dog mm -hmm. like you've got you're just getting hammered on the concussion side he's going fuck we got to get some other stories, even if they're bad for us. We got to get them out there because that this heat has got to come off of us. And it just seems, and I mean, and I'm not, I've never played quarterback in the NFL, but um, it just, it just seems ridiculous. I think. 
it seems like it's gone on a long time. And and I've always said this. I mean, Tom Brady is is the he's the figure in this in this league, right? I mean, let's call it the way it is. I mean, he is he has been great for this league at so many levels. None of it makes any sense. I it's mean, unfortunate. Goodell super tight with Mr. Kraft. You've got Tom Brady, who is who he is, and arguably the face mm-hmm. of the league. I don't know. I, I what, what the hell are you? Unless you're trying to to create a distraction in and around the concussion issue, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense that you would let this thing drag on like that. Yeah, it Did, doesn't. It doesn't seem like it. I, I hope. I mean, I hope that we move on and focus on. Yeah, not gonna, well, now you're in. It's in federal court, and federal court isn't going to just go. Okay, we, we decided we're going to move on. Like I think they go. They, they go where they wherever they're going to go. Going to go right. And does it? I mean, does it matter? I guess it does matter if you deflate the balls. Like if I were catching, if I was playing football, like I throw football with my kids and shit. Like I love it when it's a little softer. Like you can you can grip it more and you can catch it easier. And I like that. But well, I, but maybe know, it doesn't go as far or or whatever. I think, as you know, in baseball, I mean, they've doctored balls. Things have happened before, as you you mentioned earlier, right? And when that whole thing came out, what was it? A matter of I don't even know how many psi it was. People weren't thinking about that, right? And when when we went to the spot where teams were responsible for their footballs, unfortunately, that opens up Pandora's box in a certain way, right? Because back to what I'm saying, people are always yeah. going to try to get creative within the confines of the rules. So um, the refs should just walk out with the footballs. I think. I think. Yeah. I think. There's like here's be- your guys. Here's the football. Mark is like go. Like that's it. That's not. Yeah, it, 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 there is a lot of similarities to cycling. I mean, I, I you know, I, again, you've got how many teams? Twenty nine or thirty or twenty two? Yeah. Thirty two. There you go. Um, so all these quarterbacks, you know, can can tweak them. You know, back in the day, that like you said, they eat those spitballs or, or greasers or cork your bat or and the same in cycling. Mm-hmm. But dude, you get 10, 15 years down the road, and people are just appalled. They're like these fucking cheaters. Right. Look at these. And, me, and, and meanwhile, you know, you, you know, Yogi Bear is like, well, that's what we all did. But what we all did doesn't always fly. Right. That's for sure. <laughs> I've come to find out. <laughs> you. Have. Speaking of that, so and this is that you got to run. So we'll wrap this up. But you're uh, you're headed to the tour. Heading to the tour. Can't wait. I've been there one other time. Was at a time trial in Nice uh, three years ago. Um, I'm was having a team time trial. It was, was a team, it time, team trial. time trial. Yeah. The first one, it was, a, you it, went just as a fan or you were embedded with the team Went as a fan this time, as standing I on the side of the road, stand on the side of the road, it was Thomas Coca-Cola ended up helping me out, getting close by my, my family and I, and so it was good, but I couldn't speak French. They got in a car and someone drove me to another side of the, the area and I was thinking they were taking advantage of me. So I had to get out of the car and walk back and I missed a few things, blah, blah, blah. This year, um, I mentioned to you that, um, have an opportunity to go, um, and be, Stage 12, right? Montpellier to Mont Ventoux, and then the the, the, t- the time trial the next day. So two stages, huh. 12 and 13. Um, so you're okay. So you're you're going to go up the vault, and you're in your you're embedded with Sk- Team Sky. Team Sky, right? David yeah. Brailsford, who I've gotten to know over the last few years in leadership symposiums and such. Um, he's invited me to do that, so I'm excited. He's about the it. smartest man cycling. <laughs> I, that's wait, all good. Wait, I loved your wait, text to me when wait, I told wait, you wait. I was going to do that. But. Um, that's, yeah, we, that's a whole nother podcast, yes. but, um, maybe, yeah, we should have him on the podcast. That's the problem. You yeah. know, a guy like that, he would never fucking, he do would that. never, um, <laughs> well, one of these years he might, but yeah, so, so you, anyway, so you're in, in, in the first car. Cause you know, the, there's two cars in the caravan. So there's, you brought, you know, all this shit, yeah. but the listeners may not know. So every team has two cars. And then obviously there's tons of sponsor cars and neutral support and media cars and, um, but you're in the, in the first car going up the Von two. Looking forward to it. And, and i have you ever I'm, been on the Von two? No. And I'm ho- evidently, yeah. and are you, are you a Christian Vanderbilt guy? Do you guys hang? You guys know each other pretty yeah, well? Yeah, I know Christian well. So we're, we're supposed to try to all get together and do a ride, you know, um, one of those days. Cause I'm going to be there what, just the day before and then all the way through. And then I have to get, make my way back to Nice. But you, they should have you on the show. They should have you on the NBC show because it's so boring. I mean, we need we need cool people like you. <laughs> that would be that'd be fun. But I anyhow, know. I mean, so you're gonna and, and think about this, right? So if if Froome stays upright, um, which is, is a big if, um, and you you know you get to, he's he's obviously the 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 favorite. Although I think Quintana is there too. So, but nonetheless, you're gonna be that's the fifty yard line, dude. You're like yeah. that's not even the fifty yard line. You're you're 
you're with Dan Quinn, like mm. holding his notepad right there. Like that's it. So that's that be a shit. I mean, the Von two is you bringing your bike. Well, I guess you want you'll be in Montpellier the you know night before. What? So you, but but David said that he's going to hook me up with a dogma. So I'm I don't know uh, Pinarello. Like, yeah. Uh, anyhow, I, I'm what is I is with like thirty pounds. Is that what? <laughs> <laughs> that's what but uh well we, uh we're talking way too much about cycling but um no but you'll you'll find it interesting i mean Vontu is is one of the sanctuaries of cycling can right? i share one thing about cycling with yeah. you because here, here's what i do believe so i've grown up in football all my life and, and i've been around a lot of big time athletes in a lot of different sports obviously football um i am so far from being starstruck or uh, that's just not my world and yet i have a real passion for for the sport that you were involved with and because, you know, all of us who, who are sort of want to be, you know, because we can do it, right? We can't play football anymore. We can't, you know, we don't play basketball the same way. So I'm really, you know, enthralled with what's going on with cycling. That's why I have an opportunity to spend time with David Brills for talking about just leadership principles in cycling. I think it's very interesting to me. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I think, look, I look back and I think about all the tours, and I know you don't want to talk a whole much about cycling, but, and, and people always ask me, because they know we know each other, what was your favorite tour? And I said, you know, 2001, 2003, we start talking about what happened and, and you know, the look, the whatever else it was going across the pastures and, mm -hmm. and the fall and the recovery. And I think about all those things and I thought, okay, that's, that's what grit is about, right? Recovering from that. And then I circle it back around and I start thinking about my own situation, which you alluded to earlier. Okay, are you on the hot seat or not on the hot seat? All of us who have grit about us and, and sort of uh, resiliency, it's about we've been taught, get the hell back up take the shot in the face, whatever you have to do. Okay, so this is the third year of going on the proverbial hot seat. But all that I've learned from the people who are really driven in this world in sports, I think that's what, that's what it's about, right? I mean, in the end, if it doesn't happen, things don't work out at whatever level, you have to be able to look yourself in the mirror, right? You know that. We all right. have to, right, as far as com competition. So. Well, you, yeah, you got to get back up. I mean, it, it's like, you know, when you're a kid or when you're teaching your kids to ride a bike, they, they fall over, they fall down, they crash. And a kid crashes, it depends how hard they crash, but they're like, okay, I'm done. I'm like, <laughs> I'm done for the day or I'm done forever. I don't want to ride my bike anymore. I'm scared. I'm hurt. Right. I'm crying. I mean, you, I, you know, that's the point I think where it, this is a metaphor, but I mean, you have to get back on the bike. Like, like, even if you just get back on for 10 seconds, just like give me a 10 second ride. Like that's, so you, yeah, you carry that on in life. And I mean, fuck, this podcast is getting back up. Right, so my shit goes just nuclear, um, and that—that's what this is, I guess, in some way, right? So I'm, no question. I'm, I have all these cool, interesting, fun friends that I think people would want to hear from, and we're gonna have a conversation. So that—that's uh, all. Yeah. Well, one of, one of the things I was gonna say to you along those lines too, because you do have some great people. I was thinking about your network is like amazing, and I was thinking about. Okay, you know, some of the people that, you know, you had out at the uh, Barefoot Challenge the other day, I mean, really successful people who have been through a lot, right? So I look back, if I could share this, it's, it's a really interesting thing. When I first, I was at New England, right? I was a middle management guy, right? Middle management personnel director. And because we were doing well, right? Anyone's going to reap, not anyone, good people, adept people are going to reap the benefits of a good, successful organization. So I was with New England. Arthur Blank's looking for the next general manager. And he says, okay, well, let's reach out to uh, New, uh, New England, and let's, if nothing else, let's glean information. Hey, I hear there's this guy from Boulder. He has blue hair. This, I swear to God, this was like bantered around, uh, bantied around in the league that I was this off-the-wall guy. Arthur said, well, I want, to I want to interview him because in Home Depot, I always thought outside the box. So here I was. I was, again, in this situation, his first two or three choices, well, three choices were Bill Cowher, Pete Carroll, and Bill Parcells, not in that order big time football guys to be his general manager. And then, then there was another group of four or five GMs that were already GMs. And then there was my, my group. So I swear to God, I was eighth on, on the list. People often ask me, were you, were you pissed or were you, were you offended that, um, you know, offended about what? So I, I remember. Offended about being behind Bill Parcells. Yeah. I'm so yeah, pissed. Right. That, that this is seem, bullshit. That doesn't seem right. But here's what I'm going to share. So all my life, just like you, I was, I was, I always was, was pushed to say, when you're on the bench, you better have your proverbial plan ready, right? Your book ready. And for four or five years prior to having this interview, I'd been working on things. So I, whenever I'm speaking to some of the youth around, I'm like, be ready. You never yeah. know when your time's going to come, right? Your time came in a different, different sport, different way, and all of a sudden you capitalized on it. 
capitalizing on your, your, your opportunities. To me, that is so big. So here I am, take a huge swing for the fence back in uh, 2008. It was post-Michael Vick. I was going to say. It was post-Michael Vick. And a week later, I spent four hours interviewing with Arthur, and uh, we had a great discussion. A lot of it had to do, interestingly enough, with athletic performance, right? He knew that I had the ability to scout and such, and reputation was solid, obviously. But I was really interested in where you know, our league is going with a, from a sports performance standpoint. You guys were way ahead of us in cycling. Our league is really jumping up to be on the front end, and it's a really cool topic, maybe another topic of another, for another conversation. But where we are right now, next, next wave technology, next wave st- you know, statistical analysis, we are so much further than we ever were. Yeah. Love you're, it. You're, you're seeing that in every uh, – you know, yeah. every, obviously you see it in cycling. You see it in – you just talked about it in football. You see, I was watching. I, I love swimming, so I was watching the the swimming, the Olympic trials, and just the the type of analysis. Like they have the separate room now. Like the these swimmers, which is not that I guess is not that cutting edge, but they they get done with their heat or their final. They go into this this video room where they can break down. They have underwater cameras and all the you know blah blah blah, and so they can write real time, right? Or you know one minute or five minutes or thirty minutes after, they can go break down their performance, whether it's their stroke or. A, a, a wall that they missed or so that's happened. So that happens right with, with all sports. Right. And you see, you see it in cycling, like cycling is fast now. And people, people want to say, Oh, it's because of this and that, and you know, this bullshit. But I, 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 I mean, I like to believe that, that, that things evolve, humans evolve, training evolves. Mm-hmm. Look at, look at technology, obviously the bikes evolve and all these things evolve, but you guys can have a, a a huge opportunity with wearables and i mean obviously the yeah. biggest at least for i think for this country not to keep harping on this but you know on the technology side with the helmet and and i, I don't know if there's a if there is an answer there or not but i mean for that league you gotta and for for the for the mothers and fathers out there in america like if you look at who plays football now I, 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 a couple of years ago i played golf with harris barton oh yeah won a few super bowls with the 49ers mm-hmm. He's got three boys. I said, oh, so, and he's a super nice guy. I said, uh, your kids play football. And he goes, no, my wife won't let them. So here, here his wife is, is, is in the position that she's in with the husband that she has with three boys. She says, no, she says, Harris, I've seen your former teammates. Right. I'm not, I mean, so that's, you're going to have this, the talent pool is just going to go away, which is still going to have a big talent pool, but. That has to be, again, not to keep harping on it. But you see the technology right now is that, you know, the ownership meetings and and what they're doing with helmets is unbelievable. It's just like virtual reality, right? Virtual reality is a big, big thing right now. It's a budding, uh, you know, business in our league. People are trying to do it. I had an opportunity to go to McLaren um, uh, in uh, in London, right, to watch F1. Did you guys do a lot of of virtual reality back then as far as races and or not? No. But but for Matt but that Ryan, VR is going to change. Virtual VR. reality is going to change everything. It's going to change. And everything. and for guys studying different formations and different exactly. players, I mean, you're you're going to slap on whatever the gizmo looks like, and they're going to be able to basically play the game before they play the game. Take a thousand reps in the off season for Matt Ryan instead yeah. of you know he he really will be able to do that. So it's I I love that 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 leagues and sport are going that way. I yeah. just um, as long as we keep it in. Check. Now, interestingly enough, in our league, you can imagine ownership. Some ownership is way on the front edge of it all, right? Cutting edge. The other don't want to give in to the arms race. Yeah. And so you balance that. You ever heard of Gary Vaynerchuk? I have not. So you, you need to look up. And, and all of you guys listening, so Vaynerchuk. So v, V-A-Y-N-E-R, um, I think C-H-E-K or something. But a big football fan, loves the Jets. I'll send you some links to his thing. Okay. And, and you guys out there in the world or listening can can Google it or whatever. But his, his number one uh, – um, you know, for the for the next ten years, what's going to be the the hottest sector in, in Gary Vaynerchuk's mind? And he's a brilliant guy. Is is virtual reality? Yeah, I mean, he's he's is he a scientist or what? What's no, he? he's a, he has an ad agency, kind of a, a that's more focused on new media, so social media. He's an investor. He's he's the guy's a fucking machine. Mm-hmm. But uh, we were out meeting with him uh, a few months ago on this this new thing that I'm starting. And um, we start talking about VR. We start talking about virtual reality. And he goes, he goes, can you imagine porn? <laughs> like you think about, okay, Matt Ryan throwing passes, and you know, uh, yeah. Chris Froome studying the, some climb or some turn. But then when you think of it, it's like, 
That's, that's sort of a game changer. Wow. That's a game that's, changer. That's, that's fucked up to think about. <laughs> well. Anyways, on that note, dude, thanks for doing this. I went a little long. Sorry. I went. I told you I'd keep you for 45 minutes. No, man. Whatever hour. you need, man. It was great. Enjoy and, it. And um, good luck this season. I appreciate it. Who's going to win the Super Bowl? I know you're going to say the Falcons, but if the Falcons don't win, who's going to win the Super Bowl? You know, I think you know. Let's say that. Let's say that you know you have some injuries or whatever, and you guys don't win. Who's who's the, who's the favorite? Look, I, 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 you, you keep looking at those two teams. You're looking at you know the AFC teams because I don't want to answer on the NFC side, right? I look and I, I look at both New England and, and Denver where they are. They, you know, Denver obviously has to figure out their situation, right? Guy tossing the ball. However, that's it's a little too out. late to figure that out. Don't yeah, you? It's, I'm, well, I'm, it has to kind of fall into place for sure. Is Von Miller going to go back? I, you know, I've been reading sign? a lot about it. I've been reading this. It's quite positive. But here's here's one of the or things. Or is he going to sit out? He might sit out. When, when Tom Brady, By the way, that would be stupid. Why would you sit out? I can't, I can't. I can't. That defense is so intact, as you know. When Tom Brady was driving in that final game and he didn't make it, I thought this is going to be this is going to be really, really difficult for anyone. That's no not being derogatory towards Cam, which is a whole other topic of conversation as mm-hmm. a competitor. You know, we're in the same division. But, you know. When Tom Brady wasn't able to take it in and they pressured him that way, I thought, man, this this team is just – they're playing with their ears pinned back and they are badass <laughs> where they are. Okay. Well, there you have it, guys. Dude, thanks. Awesome.